Okay, we are live, Dr. Pat. All right, thanks. Well, hello, class and YouTube users. We are very glad to have you back again today for our Hospitality Speakers Series that is uh, part of the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management at the University of South Florida, and also part of the M3 Research Center and Technology Center that we have in the school at the University of South Florida, broadcasting uh, throughout the world. So we're, we're, hope, uh, we're hoping that some of you will have some questions for us too. Uh, students, just uh, so you know, today is our last uh, speaker uh, in the series. There will be a class next week and the speaker next week, unfortunately, is me. And so you get me, but I promise to keep it very short next week. And uh, what I do is it's a little, it's a little rah-rah thing I like to do with all of you, uh, just to remind you uh, that you have family and other things besides work and school, and that's important. And then we're gonna go over the speakers that we've had this semester and talk about uh, you know, the good and the ones we wanna have back and the ones we don't wanna have back and new ones you may wanna have in the future that we didn't do this semester or in the past. Uh, just as a reminder now, as you're registering for classes, you can take this class over again. You can take it a total of three times. So the first time is required. The second two times are for the extra one credit. So if you add those together, you've got a three credit course there, basically, because this is one credit each time. And before you tell me you're doing a lot of work for one credit, please, it's okay. It's not that much work. So um, I would uh, encourage you to get registered soon if you haven't registered already. Don't wait until January to do it. Um, and there's scholarship money available. I, I posted that a week or two ago. Be sure you apply for that. We're, we're looking to give money away. All right, now on to today's speakers. It, uh, this is amazing that we're gonna finish up so strong here with the best speakers of the semester. And uh, we have Ken Edwards with us and, uh, and we have Rick, and I'm gonna pronounce your name absolutely correctly because Ken, Ken always takes the easy way out. He calls him Rick T. But I, tell me if I don't do this right, Rick. It should be Rick Tomlinovich. It's actually Tomjanovich, but that's great, Pat. You Tomjanovich, great okay. Yeah, that's not, a, that's not an L, it's a J. Okay, Tomjanovich. Okay. You know, I sounded. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, uh, so I have known uh, Rick and Ken for quite a while. Ken, I knew uh, as a student, Ken was a student in my front office management class uh, decades ago. He was, a, he was a baby. He was prematurely smart in that class. And I was a young very young faculty member in that class. And, uh, and his wife, current wife was in, in the school too at the time. And then many years later, I got to, re, uh, to, meet, to meet Rick. Uh, Ken and Rick were coming through the school one day and uh, he stopped in and Ken said, you remember me from class? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was teaching a food lab. And so those two said, hey, can we hang out? I said, sure. So they came in and it was an international food and culture class, but I taught that live with real food and cooking and all that stuff. And then they said, uh, we said to them, you wanna stay and eat? And of course they said, yes. They ended up staying about five hours that day. And we had, we had a great meal. And I was impressed that they did that. That re-spurred a relationship that we've now had with them. That was probably 12, 13 years ago. And a relationship that we've had with them, uh, both in TriStar, the company that they operate, and in HM Books Online, for those of you who do our internship program, uh, you'll, you will have used or you will use three of those books. One, Ken donates to us and Rick donates to us. The other two are very minimal charge. So it's really kind of a cool thing. I've asked them to speak today about a couple of things. They're going to talk about technology and uh, they're going to talk about particularly robotics in technology because they were early adopters of Archie they'll tell you about Archie. And I've asked them to speak about management. And the reason I've asked them to speak about management is because Ken and Rick have figured out how to be part business partners in, uh, in their enterprise, running their hotels, and they own some and they manage those and many more uh, as a management company. And these are mid-sized hotels. They're the kind of hotels that I managed when I was young and they're the kind of hotels many of you ought to think about going in because you are you're going to learn so much in, in those kind of properties, you know, the 100, the 110, 150 room properties. 
So Ken and Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you now. And I think you're going to start with technology, right, guys? No, 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 no. I think, I think we're going to leave technology for the end. We're going to start okay. two parts. Um, and it'll be hotel ownership and hotel management. Um, Rick and I will probably flow back and forth. Uh, Dr. Pat, at any time you want to ask questions, interrupt us, please. Um, so I think we're going to talk about hotel operations and hotel ownership first. Yeah, good. And Akilia, just so you know, your video is not on. It's hard for these guys to speak to a black square that they can't see the beautiful person behind it. <laughs> so if you can turn your video on, it'd be great. Okay, go ahead, Ken. So much like Dr. Pat said, you know, hotel ownership is, is, is sort of unique. You know, the way to get a hotel, there's either two ways. Uh, either your parents have a lot of money and they uh, get a hotel, or number two, you build slash buy a hotel. So uh, we sort of went that route. We did our, our, our first hotel. Uh, it was actually two hotels in Phoenix. Um, we own 22% of the hotel. Uh, we paid roughly about $5 million for them and sold them for $7.9 million a year and a half later. So that deal we made somewhere around $750,000 net. What you do with that money? Well, you don't retire. You go to another hotel and you do a second hotel and a third hotel and a fourth hotel and you get more ownership um, with it. Someone once recently said to me, is the risk greater than the reward or is the reward greater than the risk? Um, and Rick's going to talk about operations here in a second because I'm going to segment over to him. But I have to tell you, you know, at the beginning of time when we started TriStar, we were hot. First five years, it just seemed like we had the golden touch. And someone once said to me, I've made a million and I've lost a million. And I sort of shook my head. Well, I can tell you, I've made a million and I've lost a million too uh, in the hotel ownership side of things. So I'm gonna let uh, Rick, I'm gonna segue over to Rick. He can talk a little bit about operations and I might jump into that a little bit and then uh, piece back to, or bounce back to uh, hotel ownership. Thank you, Ken. Go ahead, Rick. And thanks, thanks for having us, Dr. Pat, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, before you go on, I forgot one important thing. Both Rick and Ken are graduates of hospitality programs. Go ahead, Rick. That's right. So, you know, Ken spoke about the ownership side of the hotel, but there's many owners out there that purchase a hotel asset that don't have Ken's skill set and they're not hoteliers, if you will, uh, but they buy them for an investment or they buy them as a partnership or whatever reason that they have financially to purchase a hotel. And in many of those cases, they want to employ a third party management company. So not only do we, as Ken mentioned, own the hotels, but we also third party manage. Um, and through that is really where you have to have the operational expertise because now you're the steward of someone else's asset as well as your, as your own. Um, and the management piece is, is um, really where the rubber meets the road, if you will, in the operations piece. Um, in my role as operations director for TriStar, I've overseen as many as 20 to 25 managers um, all at one time. So you have to be, you have a skill set of how to understand each one of those operations, each one of those managers, their strengths and their weaknesses. All, while you're doing that, you have to make sure that you're also operating the hotel as efficiently as possible um, and returning a profit back to the owner of the, of the hotel. So that's really where, where we rely and, and hopefully that as you guys enter the market, that's where we look for people like you that are interested in hospitality. I will tell you in the hospitality industry, it is, um, it is a love. It is a love of a business. It's, it's not just a job. It is a career. And um, it starts with doing the most everyday jobs to becoming someone like Ken is as an owner of multiple hotels. So it's an integral aspect of, of, the, of, uh, of a hotel ownership and hotel management. Our first hotel we actually managed in Orlando, Florida, uh, Ken and I. Um, we were building the two hotels in Phoenix that he referenced, but we were able to manage a hotel that was in Orlando. It was at what Disney called Gate One. And when you drove by Disney, they had gate numbers, one, two, three, four. Gate One was so far off the beaten path that really didn't even have a gate number. They just referred to it as Gate One. I think we were next to a pond of alligators, but nonetheless, it was our first management deal and hotel. And it was owned by a private family. And 
we really learned a lot through that experience, good, bad, and, 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 and the ugly, if you will, but it was, it was a great experience. So Ken. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so as Rick said, um, it actually bought its time when the two hotels in Phoenix opened, uh, their brand new assets. One was a Hilton garden Inn, the other one was a holiday and express. Um, our business just took off. It just seemed like our phone rang. Um, there's something I've learned about hotel management and hotel owners. Uh, either the window's completely open or it's completely closed. What do I mean by that? I mean that it's never sort of half open. It's, it's either really open and your phone's ringing like crazy and uh, you're, you're ultra busy and uh, you're growing your staff and you have uh, funds flowing into the company and, and, it's, and it's beautiful. Um, and we learned over time that it doesn't matter how big or small the hotel is when the window's open you take that management opportunity because when the window closes, you wish you had that smaller hotel as part of your portfolio or management. So we've learned that over time. Um, imagine though, managing hotels that are local, you know, Rick and I used to say managing two or three hotels, that was pretty easy. Then you get to five or six hotels and you're saying, huh, pretty easy. Add a few more staff, a regional director, maybe. Once you get to 10 to 20 hotels, it's not easy. Um, in fact, your, your cash flow uh, is, is, is less than when you had six hotels, meaning you have to add additional accounting people, revenue managers to your corporate staff, uh, two or three uh, regional managers. And then you say to yourself, okay, you have 20 hotels, this is great, but they're in eight different states. How do you manage hotels in a different state? Like here in Arizona, it's simpler for us to manage hotels because we can just get in our car, drive over, walk the asset, talk to the management, see what their problems are, see what their concerns are, meet with them, come up with solutions. But imagine if 15 of your 20 hotels are in six or seven different states. So over time, you have to sit up, set up systems, systems at work, and whenever you break the link and your management at uh, the regional level stop doing even the smallest systems, sooner or later you get in trouble. Right, Rick? So why don't you talk about some of the systems and about managing hotels um, out of your sort of territorial area, in our case, Scottsdale and Phoenix? Correct. Thanks, Ken. Really, when you think about a hotel operator and people like Ken and I that grew up through the ranks, um, our skill set, we refer to ourselves, and Pat can appreciate this, as being very classically trained in the hospitality industry. And a good manager in hospitality has to be very hands-on, but at the same time direct his team. Um, and Ken will always tell you that you have to touch it and feel it. You have to be really deep in the details to understand what's going on. And that doesn't mean micromanaging, but that's to be aware of what's going on. And that's how you deliver a great hotel experience. And as Ken mentioned, as that organization grows, we become further detached from that touch point experience. And Ken mentioned kind of the tipping point where we have to add more staff than we have revenue, but then we have to train that staff to deliver the culture and the experiences as if we were there delivering them one-on-one -on -one as we did in the early hotels that we managed. So one thing we've adopted is we've never taken our eye off the day-to-day the -day operations. Um, we have systems in place. Uh, we use M3 accounting, actually, um, uh, software. Um, and that allows us the ability to centralize our accounting operations. But it's kind of a blended model. And what I mean by centralized accounting operations, the managers at the hotels, they receive all the invoices. They've already sent in a pre-approved purchase order for us to sign off on. They match those purchase orders that we've approved the expenditure to the invoice. They input it at M3 and it comes to our corporate controller and, and our accounting staff here. And then we post it into the appropriate accounts for the purposes of creating a P&L. The turnaround time on something like that is very intense. Once we close a month, we have 20 days to produce a financial statement for our own hotels that we own, um, our owners, and many lenders like to receive quarterly financial statements or at minimum an annual financial statement. So that all that has to be done timely. And to Ken's point, if we have two or three managers that are not doing their day-to-day -day tasks, they break that chain and that P&L is late, 
Um, and that causes a problem because a lot of decisions are made. And as you might aware, 20 days after a month to adjust for the previous month is pretty far gone. So that's one way that we utilize that system. So there has to be, for the lack of a better word, some checks and balances to be flagged up when we don't get those invoices, which is a phone call to the manager to find out what's going on. If they're in trouble, we'll back them up or we have to do some more training and education. And I think what Ken and I learned early on was the functionality of our company and the delivery of our service is as good as the least trained employee. And what do I mean by that? If we have one employee out there that we haven't taught our operational culture, that we haven't taught our operating standards and set our expectations, that hotel suffers because we're not delivering that training. And part of what we did is we invested as a company a lot of time and effort in developing a training platform that we could utilize across our portfolio of hotels that basically instructed every employee of what was in, in expected of them. And this type of training not only goes into, you know, show up for work and wear your uniform and wear your name tag, but it tells you how many rings you should answer the phone in, how you should greet the customer, what kind of culture we should be establishing in our hotels. And that requires a key word and that requires a lot of communication. While we automated, and we'll talk about technology later, we automated our training. And Ken will tell you the story about how the training originally started. We thought we were cutting edge then, but we really weren't. Uh, but for the time, I guess we were. So we try to, and then what, the other thing we'll do is we'll hold weekly meetings with our managers. Our regional people are required to have a weekly meeting with the general manager to review every aspect of their hotel. They produce a weekly report. Ken spends every Saturday morning reading the reports from all the hotels. And we take that weekly report and we communicate that weekly report out to the ownership, be it that Ken's ownership of his hotels or the third party owners that we manage for. And by establishing all that um, structure, our communications for, to ownership, which were sometimes at the early stages of our career for the knockout drag out fights. What about this? What about that? How come I don't know about this? How come I don't know about that? We quickly realized that we have an obligation as a steward of their asset to provide them timely information. So every week, each one of our hotel owners gets a detailed report about the physical health of their hotel, revenues, expenses, accounts receivable, accounts payable, maintenance, rooms out of order, all the details that you guys are learning about hotel operations. Ken, you want to add to that and how we developed a training platform? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so did you hear the magic sentence? Ken does that every Saturday. <laughs> so what does that mean? It's, this is not a nine to five job. Uh, every hotel that we walk into, everyone that we walk into is a third party manager. Could you imagine that the general manager comes in at nine or nine 30 and the general manager leaves at five? Well, in our hotels, the general manager has to be there at seven because that's where the action is. The customers are having breakfast. And if you're capturing 33 to 50% of your room base in your restaurant, that general manager should be there mingling with the customers, asking them to return. How was your stay? Did you enjoy everything? Hi, I'm Ken. I'm the general manager of the hotel. They feel important. Every hotel we walked into, right, Rick? It was a, it was, it was a nine. They knew the day we were walking in and they still came in at 9.30. So, so, so part of what Rick said, it's the love of the business. Rick and I show up for work every day, not because of what we earn, but because we love doing it. I mean, I've heard many NBA basketball players, i.e. Barkley, who said, I got paid a lot to do something that I loved. In fact, I probably would have done it for free. And that's what Rick was talking about, the love of the industry. If you love something and you're passionate about something, you will always be, be, be very successful. So that's one of the things that, that, that Rick talked about. Now, if you combine other things that happen in the hotel business, an example, we have to be the uh, liaison with the franchisor. So who's a franchisor communicating with? Not to the owner. If it's Marriott, Hilton, IHG, they're communicating directly to the management company. 
So not only are we managing the employees, but in a sense, we're managing the franchisor, as we call the brand as well. We're creating relationships. We're working back and forth over years. We're trying to make sure that we get the most out of our franchisor that, and the brand that we possibly can. Now you also sprinkle in a renovation. So you have 20 hotels, three are in different parts of renovation. You're dealing with your franchisor, you're having your weekly meetings, and you're creating a PL 20 days after the month. Does that sort of sum it up, Rick? That's a lot of moving parts, Ken. And moving parts. Yeah. And, and when you talk about the franchisor relationship, that's probably the most important part of the relationship. Um, franchises are big machines, or franchise companies are big machines. They have systems and policies and procedures. And they pretty much, in most cases, outside of bad economic times, they dictate to the ownership group and to us what a hotel is going to look like, how it's going to operate, what rules you're going to follow, and what new purchases you're going to make to run your hotel. And one of the key things that Ken mentioned was the relationship aspect. Not only do we spend a lot of times managing our day-to-day -day operations business, I must have and Ken must have three, 300 lanyards apiece of conventions that we've attended, conferences that we've attended, um, uh, with the brands and our sole purpose to attend those conferences is to build those relationships so that when one of our owners that owns possibly a Marriott Courtyard or a Hilton Garden Inn has a problem either with their franchise agreement, with their renovation process, with their license, meaning their franchise agreement expiring, not being renewed, we do that with our relationships and part of our service is delivering that relationship. I'll tell you a quick story. We purchased a Hilton Garden Inn in California and their license, we, the owner purchased it and Ken's a partner in that hotel, but the larger part of the ownership, they all purchased that hotel knowing that that license was going to expire and Hilton already told us that there was no way they were going to renew that license for that hotel. And Ken and I brokered and held well, probably four or five different meetings with the brand and the ownership group. And after convincing and discussing and providing data, providing the reasons why we thought the brand was making a poor decision, why this should continue to be a brand, Ken was able to successfully negotiate a brand new 20 year franchise agreement. That doesn't happen if we can't pick up the phone and call somebody in within Hilton to, to, to have a meeting. And that's part of what we do. And that, that takes a great deal of effort, skill and art. And it sounds complex, but really it's kind of what we're doing here. We're just communicating with each other and talking to each other and building those relationships. Yeah, so, so you know, we have a little saying here in the office, E is for effort, not for Edwards. And what do we mean by that? Thanks. What, what do we mean by that? You know, not only did, did Rick and I make five or six calls, you know, uh, many generations are uh, sending emails and texts. An old mentor of, our, of ours, Paul Tucker Sr. said, sometimes you have to get on a plane and get eyeball to eyeball. And, 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 and we actually, at, or actually brokered this deal in Dallas, Texas. They were having a regional meeting and we flew there, met with them for a morning and then the next day. And, um, and we weren't talking to mid-level management, we were talking to senior, senior management. And you have to be confident about talking to senior management. One of the things that your degree does for you is not just giving you education, but it gives you a level of confidence. It allows you to know that when you're sitting across from somebody negotiating a deal, that you're, you and that person are at the same level. So um, Dr. Pat actually asked me one time, did you learn a lot in school uh, for undergraduate? And I said, I did. But more importantly, it gave me a level of confidence so that I could sit across from anyone and negotiate any deal and feel comfortable about doing that. So should we segue over to robotics? Yeah, before, before segueing, guys, I just want to um, underline uh, what you said earlier, Rick, about uh, the link. And you talked about the managers as links in the... Uh, in the system, and, and the key word is system. System means you can you're doing tasks that are repeatable, 
And so if they're repeatable, well, then let's, let's know how we're going to get them done. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we have to do it, you know. And I think the example you gave of invoices is great. And I, I used to go through that with Howard Johnson. So it was years ago. It wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. But, uh, you know, they had, to keep, they had to keep tabs on what was happening in our Region 7. So it was very important. And Ken, uh, why don't you just tell them a little bit about the involvement that both you and Rick, or both of you talk about, have even further in those brand companies. You sat on the on the or the the governing board of uh, IHG, I think, for a while, didn't you? Yeah. So again, effort is everything, and passion is important. Um, so you start off if if you're lucky enough, they put you on a committee, and they might have twelve or thirteen or fourteen different committees, and you work through the committees, and maybe they make you a vice chair of a committee. I was fortunate enough to be nominated and approved to be on the board of directors for Intercontinental Hotel Group. Uh, after 14 years, uh, 12, or, yeah, 12 years of being on committees, then four years as a board of director, um, you meet a lot of people. Um, all our committee meetings were in Atlanta. So we had to fly from Phoenix to Atlanta four times a year. And then of course we had the annual conference once a year. So there were five trips that you had to make just with one brand with IHG. Rick had a similar, and I'll let him tell you about it, where he was on the advisory uh, board for uh, Carlson Hospitality. Yeah, yes, I spent a number of years, probably eight to 10 years on the Carlson advisory board. And they, at the time they owned the Rad Radisson brand and the Country Inn and Suites brand. And I had the privilege of attending many private dinners with um, uh, Mrs. Carlson, and she was just delightful. But whenever we needed anything, whenever we had a, a question, they, they looked at us as peers. And imagine going into a board of directors, as, to Ken's point, feeling that you know they might appear bigger than you, but at the end of the day, they're just a human being trying to do a human job. And we just treat them as individuals. Um, and we built those relationships every day. I can tell you that one of the largest and prestigious conferences is the Arizona Lodging Conference. And there was a year or two early in our career where we took our last nickels, if you will, and bought passes to go to the lodging conference. And uh, that's the who's who of the hospitality industry where we met people that are just legendary in this business. and. We had to be there as a presence, as small as we were, we had to appear stronger than what we were. And part of that was to show that we are equal to those people and in a, in a good way. Um, we had the great pleasure of meeting Bill Fortier uh, from Hilton. Uh, we got a one-on-one -on -one audience at his office. People ask me, how did you do that? How did Ken get you in front of Bill Fortier? Very simple. We picked up the phone and asked for a meeting. <laughs> And that's really was the effort. And there are people that are truly intimidated when they see, when they used to see John Q. Hammonds walk through a room who became a personal friend of mine or Bill Fortier or Steve Belmonte or some of these people that are icons in the industry, the Adrian Curry's at Hilton and uh, et cetera. And it's all because at the end of the day, you're equal to them. And you just have to pick up the phone and ask. And if you don't knock on the door, it'll never open. And I must tell you one thing that, and we learned from each other, but one thing I learned from Ken was, it's okay to knock on the door and knows a complete sentence and you may get rebuffed, but if you knock a second and third time, eventually somebody's gonna sit down and talk to you. And that's exactly what's happened. And to your point, Pat, we've rev leveraged those relationships to, to solve some of the most complex items in, with franchisees and owners and the, fran and the brands, such to such that they call us and ask us for advice when they maybe want to roll out a new initiative or a new program. Now it's more of, what do you guys think? How do you think the franchise community is going to accept this from us? And we're very candid and open with them. And that's really how you build, build trust. And, and just one more comment on that. I know we're going to get over to technology. We're doing okay on time. But I just wanted to, to reinforce to all of you students and you audience what you're hearing Ken and Rick talking about. We've talked about this a lot this semester in other speakers that have been here, it's networking. Networking is a buzzword, but what it really means is you gotta commit yourself 
you sit through meetings sometimes, as Rick said, you maybe maybe spend some money that you you wonder why you're spending and you go to these meetings, but you, yeah, there are parts of it that, you know, probably you, you are a little boring. That's okay. But every time you do that, you meet, even if it's one new person, two new people, and you have some insight. This last week, you know, I sit on the, on the, on the uh, credentialing committee for the American Hotel and Lodging Association. And we have these meetings that go for four hours. But I know that every time I have one of those meetings, I'm going to walk away with a great idea that then I'll share with Ken later. <laughs> but, uh, so the networking, what you're hearing from these two gents is critical. And uh, so I just want to thank you both for, for underlining that. So, so here's some advice. Uh, as, as Rick noted, um, prior to COVID, we were probably going to, I don't know, 15 to 20 large conferences um, each year um, together and independently because we just couldn't go together. But we had one thing that we always said, when you walk into a room, get noticed. I'll say that to you students, when you walk into a room, make sure they notice you. So don't just walk in and sort of blend in with the crowd, be a little different. And even when you're a little off centered, it's noticeable. So don't feel as if, oh, these, these, these are all the Cornell graduates wearing their, their blue blazers and their red ties, you know, be noticed, be confident. Don't worry about what they might think of you or what you might think of them. Just be noticed. Do you agree with that, Rick? I do, and I'd like to add one more thing. The other thing that you have to do is never quit learning. Um, I've been in this industry 40 plus years now, and I just soak up new information. I soak up new techniques, new procedures. Obviously, a big thing, as Pat mentioned, the way we did things years ago to today has been done through technology. So. Just this weekend, I had the pleasure of spending some time with Carrie Walsh Jennings. I don't know if you know her. She's the Olympian, Olympic volleyball player. She's won three gold medals. At the age of 42, she's going to compete again in the Tokyo Olympics when they have them. Wow. And she formed this new organization called uh, 1440. So I walked up and spent, I was one of her chaperones for the weekend. On a, anyway, long story short, I said, Carrie, can you tell me what 1440 is about? She looked me square in the eye and she says, you don't know? And I said, no, I don't. She says, that's my organization. I said, why 1440? She says, there's 1,140 minutes in a day. How are you gonna use yours? Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, after all the people I've met, after all the people I've spoken to, after all the people we noted in our conversation, I took pause and I said, walked away. And I said to myself, are you using your 1,440 minutes every day the best you can and you take inventory and you make changes and adjustments and i would want to share that with you because for me it was just a moment even at my experienced age to say i won't say old pat i said experience oh, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, at, at my age i still take pause and i say what can i do to be better what can i do to be stronger and and, and i would encourage each one of you to adopt that kind of uh, mentality as you go into the hospitality industry when you graduate and get your diploma, that's not the end of learning. It has to be continuous. And in the segue back to me, uh, Dr. Pat will tell you that I'm a student at USF. I'll be graduating. Uh, uh, my graduation date, I think, is set on December 10th. Uh, I have my master's, and, I, and I've had Dr. Pat as a professor and Dr. Chian as a professor. And you might say to yourself, you just got your master's? And the answer is yes. And Rick talks about you want to continue to learn, so on and so forth. A good friend of mine said to me, so Ken, when you get your master's, are you going to give yourself a raise? It wasn't to me about getting a raise, but it was to me about um, learning. And uh, again, we talk about effort, or at least I talk about effort so much. You know, for a person that has more experience, as, as, as Rick noted, we're a little bit older, to go back to school and to use tools like Canvas um, that I had never used before, that you use every day. Um, I have to tell you, it was, it was, it was a great uh, time. It'll be something that I remember forever. And uh, one of my classmates actually moved to Phoenix and he's working with us here in Phoenix. And his name is Sam. 
And, and by the way, Ken did that, uh, that program uh, purely, well, he came a few times, but purely uh, virtually, just the way we're doing this right now. We had, we'd have Ken on, and a couple other people too. We had somebody from California, some people from Tampa on a big screen in room 221 at the end of the room. And then the rest of us at a seminar table. And you know, Ken, the truth is, uh, as you and Rick were just saying, you distinguished yourself in there. You, 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 never, uh, you never tried to say, well, gosh, I know more than the rest of you. You weren't, a, you, weren't, you weren't ashamed to say that you have a lot of experience and you've been doing it, but that all worked together with us and the faculty to really have fabulous classes because you were in there and uh, in a very comfortable way. So I uh, appreciate that. Sure. All right. Well, we're going to talk about robotics now? Sure. Sure. Well, we're going to talk about, excuse me, robots. We're going to talk about um, artificial intelligence a little bit and software that we're developing here with Rover. Um, but we'll talk about e-learning first um, and, and, and we'll sort of get that out of the way. So we started a company called HM Bookstore, uh, stands for Hotel Management and Bookstore. Uh, we learned in um, before 2010 that managing employees in eight different states and getting them the proper training was difficult because the franchisor, they were not giving us training um, vehicles to use with our employees. So we, we, we created our own LMS, Learning Management System, in 2007. We built it. We customized it. Um, we're not in the uh, code development business, but we somehow sort of uh, hired some people and we had the vision to do that. Then you have to write material. You know, content is king. So we had 30 books, 40 books, 80 books. Now we have 150 ebooks. Uh, we're moving our, our uh, platform from uh, what's called .NET to HTML5, which is what you use with Canvas. And, um, you know, there's an expense to all of this. We, we burned through over a million dollars, probably a million and a half dollars over the course of 10 years of creating this. And imagine having an e-learning company to where it's, it's, it's very dynamic before COVID. So COVID has sort of fast forward our product um, from, a, from the university point of view. Um, we're, we're, we're extremely, extremely busy uh, January, 2021 and beyond. Um, because of, of this fast forward that e-learning is on uh, or with COVID. But before I transition to Rick, I want to tell you how we got our pricing for the students. So Dr. Pat was at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, he was the assistant dean there, and he had one of his professors. His name was Al. And Al said to us, hey, I want to use your e-books for our internship folks, and I do internships. Rick and I are sitting there. Again, remember how you have to do things face-to-face? Eyeball to eyeball. At so, the Italian deli. Yes, it was at the Italian <laughs> deli, right? And, 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 and Al looks at us. He says, how much do you charge these students? We said, heck, Al, we don't know. He says, well, I want them to buy three books and they can spend $60. So it's $19.99 a book. Now, that was in 2010, maybe 2011. They're still in $19.99. So that's that's... You think like you go through this whole big marketing survey and study and ask the customer what they want, you know, to figure out pricing. Well, not us. Al said $19.99 and that's still the price. So Rick, you, you want to close HM Bookstore and then we'll talk about uh, Archie and we'll talk about Rover. Yeah, I will. And I want to, again, talk about HM Bookstore in context of effort. Uh, one of the problems we, we recognized when we built HM Bookstore originally that it was for our employees to make our employees better. And then Ken looked at me one day and he said, wait a minute, if this is good enough for our employees, it's got to be good enough for other employees. And I said, you're right. And that's when we started meeting with Dr. Mario and Al and started this university portion of it. So we started there because Ken wanted to touch future employees, which I thought was a great idea. But one of the things that we did is we were trying to figure out how do we get HM Bookstore out to the masses? And timing sometimes just happens, again, through relationship. I don't know if any of you are familiar with an organization called AHOA, Asian American Hotel Owners Association. 
They're the largest organization and lobby in the hospitality industry. They own about 50% of the hotel inventory. And they were offering a certified hotel owners program where you had to go to a live class, spend five days, pay about $2,000 plus your lodging to become a certified hotel owner. Again, through Ken's tenacity, we kept calling a hole and said, we have a better way. And they said, no, we like what we're doing. A year later, Ken called and said, we have a better way. Finally, we flew down to Atlanta and Ken said, you're gonna meet with us. And they did. As a result of that, they have taken the CHO program and we took in, in conjunction with them, they selected 60 of our eBooks that are used to train the AHOA members to become a certified hotel owner. And that's a, a very prestigious designation. We backbone all of that training. Um, and guess what happened to AHOA's benefit? If AHOA had not done that, they wouldn't have a CHO program as we sit today because they were delivering it in person and they would have had to change a platform to this. We were ahead of that curve just by happenstance with COVID. They are now ecstatic that they have a delivery that's all electronic. So a hotel owner doesn't have to leave his property. A hotel owner doesn't have to travel, pay for a hotel. They take all 60 books online from anywhere that they are. 24 they have 90 and they take it 24 seven. Again, sometimes just because you're persistent, you not only benefit your cause, but you help others through that persistence. And Ken, it, you wanna have close anything on that? Sure, and at AHOA, the buzz is how smart they were because they're, they have 19,000 members and their member says, look how smart AHOA is. We're ahead of the curve. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is for six years, they said no. Each year they said no. So finally, much like we said before, you got to get across the table. We said, can we just fly to Atlanta? And they, and they went like this. Okay. All right. So we had a four hour presentation slot. We gave them a presentation and uh, that's, that's how we started talking about e-learning. Again, that was in probably 2016, 2017 when we, when we went through that negotiation. And they the can comp. eventually get a USF certificate too, once we work on that. Right, right. And, and, and the common thread that you keep hearing from us, effort, tenacity, don't go into a room without being noticed. You know, so you only get so much time, much, much like, like the person with Rick said, what are you gonna do with those minutes? You only have so much time. You flew all the way to Atlanta, you better get their attention. So those, those are some of the things that you wanna take away as a student. And remember, the college degree will give you confidence years later to sit across from your peers and to note that so what you're about to say is as important as about what they just said. So, so now we're gonna talk about, uh, let's move uh, from HM Bookstore. You wanna talk about Rover or you wanna talk about um, Archie first, Rick. Let's start with let's start with Archie. Okay. So once again, um, Archie is a robot through a company called Savioki, or Savioke, I think is the correct pronunciation. Uh, they're out of San Jose, um, Silicon Valley area, and they developed a robot that they use in hospitals to transport medicines or whatever the, they needed from point A to point B. And uh, Ken came into my office once again and he knocked on my door and he says, how do you feel about a robot? And I said, what, am I getting replaced? What's going on here? And he says, no, 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 no. He says, I have an opportunity because I made this relationship with this company about having a robot that sits in the lobby of our hotel that is heat mapped in the entire hotel. And if you want a soda and a candy bar or fresh towels or soap or shampoo, delivered to your room. The front desk clerk just puts in the uh, room number and Archie's program to go down the hall or actually to the front desk. You open them up, you load the stuff in. Archie goes to the elevator and he calls down the elevator. He goes up to the floor and he comes to the front door of your room. And as he's standing there, your telephone rings to let you know that Archie's outside of your door with an item to deliver. I say, get out of here. That's like science fiction stuff. He says, no, it's real. 
He says, and so I'm going to call them and see if they're willing to do that at our hotels. Ken, I'll let you take it from there. Well, so um, we were one of the first in the history of the world to have robots in a hotel in 2015, 2016. It's still there. Um, its name is Archie. There was a cartoon a long time ago uh, called Archie, and it sort of has that sort of futuristic theme. Um, and that's, that's how it got its name. We have three of them in three different hotels. One's a casino hotel, and it actually goes through different parts of the casino. Another one's at a limited service or select service hotel in Bloomington, Indiana, which is Indiana University. We thought it would be unique because uh, they do a lot of technology at that university. And then the other one, which was our first, is uh, in California. So Archie's really cool. It delivers about 300 deliveries a month. So you can multiply that, to see how many uh, deliveries a year. Uh, you can give it a one to a five star rating. Uh, our Hilton in um, California has a 4.92 rating over four years. Um, it does really, it does other things too. And I'll give you an example. If you had a birthday party at the pool, Archie can come out to your birthday party with balloons to all the, the kids at the pool at your birthday party. If you were, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. We had one customer that um, Archie came over and the, cust and, the and the window opened and um, there was a, a diamond ring and that customer proposed to his girlfriend to get married using Archie as the deli delivery vehicle for the diamond ring. Um, so we use Archie for coffee breaks. If you're at a coffee break, it comes in with uh, loaded with cookies. I think actually, uh, Rick, didn't we use Archie at a Cree meeting? They were given away um, or, or, or I think, no, no, I think there were five people that received thousand dollar scholarships Yes. and each person came up, Archie came over cause, cause we actually took Archie to the meeting and uh, we had a little joystick and uh, opened up and person reached in there and gave the diploma. So Archie's more than just a delivery. It's just how creative you want to be and how excited you are about having something that's new. So, um, Go ahead, Rick. And if you take away the sizzle that Ken just described, because that's really what it is, it's the sizzle and the newness and the technology. We have owners that call me and say, hey, you know, robots cool and all that, but how's it helping me make money? And think about this scenario. And it, it comes down to the service aspect that we're all responsible for, because we need to do it right every time for every customer. So imagine that it's two o'clock in the morning you have one night auditor at the front desk. You're at a 200 room Hilton Garden Inn and you forgot your toothbrush. So the phone call goes something like this. Hi, I'm in room 212. I need a toothbrush. Oh, that's fine. Why don't you just, I, if, I'm by myself. So come on down and get it. Which means I got to get dressed. I got to go downstairs. I got to pick up the toothbrush and I got to go back to my room. Not really what I would call a pleasant experience when I'm paying, you know, a couple hundred dollars a night to stay at a hotel. So instead they say, that's great. Is there anything else you need? We have the gift shops open. We have, you know, do you need a Coke or a candy bar, a bag of chips? Oh yeah, that'd be great. And we load them up in Archie and it delivers it up to the room. What do you think the two experiences are like? One's an A++ and the other one's a D at best, maybe not an F. So it, it, it really creates a labor savings because now we don't have to have a second person to make those deliveries. and. We did the analytics on it, and a lot of deliveries took place over the graveyard shift from 11 at night till 7 in the morning. And again, it just creates an experience and a buzz for the customer. Now, I would imagine um, that that customer is going out and telling their friends and neighbors and everybody else, hey, I was at this cool Hilton Garden Inn, and I had this robot, and they keep telling the story. So not only do we get the service end of it, but we get the word of mouth transference of people talking about it. Right, and then and then we have our own hashtag, so they can uh, tweet it, and they can also um, put it on Facebook. Uh, so we have a, a PR person that actually handles that. <clears throat> but let me give you what the future looks like. So here's what the future looks like. Oh, you paying attention? All right, all right. So this is what the future looks like. We we believe it's going to be hospitality without a human touch. 
So you're going to make a phone call and an autonomous car is going to pick you up. Then you're going to get a registration on your mobile phone. You're going to sign in, push send. Your mobile phone, your mobile device is going to become a key. So you're going to bypass the front desk. You're going to go right to your room. You're going to check in using your mobile phone as a key. You want to order room service. You're going to order room service right from your mobile device. A robot's going to deliver your room service. You're going to stream all, all of your favorite TV shows in the room. You're going to be able to adjust the temperature of the room and the mood lights of the room using your mobile phone. And you're going to check out and you're going to get some sort of social media request. And you're going to do it all on your phone. That's what the future looks like. And that future is not too far from now. So Rick, you want to talk about Rover a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so one of the other aspects of the industry is, is that when Ken talks about this touchless interaction, you still have to really touch him in a different way. So one of the difficult things for a manager to do is to forecast the labor needs, because even in the scenario Ken described, there are labor needs that you have to have. There are forecasting that you have to have. I mean, you still have to have cooks cook. You still have to have housekeepers clean. You still have to have chefs. You still have to have managers. That won't go away. So, but one of the was to capture a dashboard experience from a management operation standpoint, where a manager could look at his incoming arrivals, what part of the country they're coming from, how to engage them, and so that the manager could accurately understand what's happening in their hotel today tomorrow and for the next 90 days so that they can appropriately plan. So with that, uh, we've taken um, Sam, who we mentioned that, that Ken had hired from um, his experience at uh, USF. He hired Sam to come in and help build that platform along with our other IT developers. And that platform is now in beta testing. So that platform goes in and we are able to go to the property management systems of various ho hotel brands, Opera, OnQ, uh, Choice Advantage, and scrape data, historical data, and take that data and make forecast projections and understand what's coming in the future. And then it'll have a guest engagement piece that we're gonna tack in after that. So Ken, you wanna take it from there? Sure, yeah, so, so the terminology is called text mining, right? So. Um, everybody that is making a reservation, uh, they're using their phone and in that, in that data is their phone number. So when you have this seamless or this hospitality without a human touch, as Rick said, you still need to communicate with the customer, but you don't want to have an app if you're a customer. So I might see at four different hotels, four different applications on my phone. I just don't want it. Well, we're able to have your phone number we know when you're checking in and now we can communicate with you uh, via texting and you can communicate to us. You need more towels, room 212, like Rick mentioned, they text it, we send up the towels. If they say that uh, room service, you forgot the mustard, mustard gets delivered via text. And, and, and the piece that's missing is this, this communication piece. And that's really what Rover is. Rover is a communication piece that allows us to communicate with the customer before they check in and after they've checked in. In addition, it allows us to forecast. It allows us to do some desktop marketing. Uh, in the old days, we used to call that bounce back couponing. So we're able to, if you have a full service hotel, you could send a message to everybody with a touch of a button that if you stay with us in the first quarter of 2021, you get free breakfast during your entire stay. So it allows the general manager to be more engaged as a sales feature, but using technology. And just like HM Bookstore, we weren't in the technology business, but we saw that there was a, a product that uh, hotel operators and owners needed. And that's why we actually are, are, are working on Rover. Um, we think it might be our biggest technology thing or piece that we've ever developed. Now, Dr. Pat, I see that there's some questions down on the chat. Do you want to field those questions? Yeah, but before we do that, uh, Ken and Rick, I just want to be sure we all uh, have embraced uh, an understanding of this concept. So Rover 
isn't a device. Rover is a uh, software, right? That will be used through your phone. Is that pretty much what we're talking about? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's software used at the hotel, but used by the customer on their mobile device. And used at the hotel as an, as a, as an adjunct to whatever, uh, whatever uh, guest management system they're using, right? That's correct. And, and, and what makes it unique is that there's no app. You don't have to put an app on your phone. Okay. We're communicating back and forth using your phone number. When you leave, there's no app on your phone. You leave. Got it. All right. Before we go to the questions coming in on YouTube, we need to give our own uh, class members an opportunity. And I think the group that uh, would like to uh, probably uh, lead off with questions today is Group B. And um, so we have members in Group B here today. Uh, and I think, uh, Sal, you're the only member from Group B today. So uh, uh, you have a question? Oh, and Akilia. I meant to say Sam, not Sam. Yeah, well, I have one question. How do you guys handle uh, like it's time management with all like your normal work, uh, your normal work plus all these innovations and like your regular lives? Um, just wanted to know how you guys handle time time management. I guess. So, so, yeah. so the great thing about owning a company. Is that when your children are playing soccer, you leave and you go to the soccer game. Uh, your kids are playing basketball, or they're in a in a play, or you have a student conference. You leave. There's no one to tell you you can't leave. So the great thing about owning a company like Rick and I is that we were able to sort of um, weave in our personal lives. Uh, and the advantage of being an owner, if my kids were, uh, as, as, as one of Rick's sons, he was a, a special hockey player. Every weekend, you know, Rick would go to these hockey tournaments and I would go to soccer tournaments, but we had mobile phones at that time. Uh, they were a flip phone, uh, which, which was a little bit different. And we communicated with the hotels uh, via our cell phones as if, as if we were in the office. So I don't know if I answer your question specifically, but but um, you have to have your personal time. The other thing is um, I had a rule that I was home by six o'clock to have dinner with my family every night. That was just my rule. And I think you're really talking about work-life balance in your question and how do you do that? Um, I will tell you whether, whether it's hospitality or I mentioned volleyball with Kerry Walsh earlier, you, you tend to weave the, your passions into what you like to do. So if you find yourself doing something that you're not passionate about, as Ken will tell you, you might want to reevaluate what you're doing, whether that's hospitality or anything else in your life. Uh, we're very passionate about we, what we do. And if I, it, it, as I reflect on my career, most of my social experiences, I mean, I enjoy nothing better than having dinner with Pat Mario and his wife. And we're both kind of in the same industry. So you'll find that a lot of your social circles will come back to that. So a lot of your social home life will revolve around it. It's, and, and Ken has a great mechanism that he kind of cuts it off, you know, at night when he gets home, six o'clock is dinner with the family. So you just kind of kind of learn how to manage that process. But again, it, it's, I think Ken said it best when he said, this is not a nothing anymore is a nine to five Monday through Friday job. Um, it's pretty much seven days a week and, you know, um, and that's why they call a new, they have a new term. We used to talk about business and leisure and hospitality. Now they call it leisure, <laughs> the combination of business and leisure, and it's called leisure. So even when you're on vacation, you're still answering emails or texts or at least touching your business just to stay relevant because the speed at which we move today is far different than the speed that Ken and I had to move and Pat had to move at, Dr. Pat, several years ago. So I hope that answers your question. And, and, and I'm just going to add to it, you know, it's all about you, right? And again, it's how are you going to use those minutes? So sleep less. You're young. That's what we did. We, we just didn't sleep a lot. So we'd get up at five o'clock in the morning. We'd be in the office at six o'clock in the morning. And, um, but we were home at six o'clock too. We put in a 10 or 12 hour day. By the way, when you get up early and you go to work early when you're young, 
it's it's really cool because you get all the stuff as Rick mentioned that you don't like to do. You do that first and you get that out of the way. So by the time eight o'clock rolls around and everybody's starting to roll in the office, it's a fun day. So just sleep less, get up early, go into work early. That's all you have to do. Yeah, another question there, Pat, for your age. Gilia has a question, probably. I do have a question. Gilia, so, it up a little bit. We want to see your, your uh, face. There. Okay. Uh, so my question is, as far as when um, Mr. Edwards, when you were talking about, you know, like walking into a room, make sure you're noticed and whatnot. Um, as far as like prepping yourself right now when you're applying for jobs and X, Y, and Z, what advice would you give someone? And I hate to make it about COVID, but like in times like this. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, let's say we get past COVID and you're going to do some face-to-face -face interviewing. Certainly, uh, you know, the interview of the future, there's several companies out there that do it um, to where you're using artificial intelligence and you're actually doing a first-end interview and then they'll have a second interview and then maybe a face-to-face -face or a Zoom-like interview. So here's what I would suggest about interviewing. Research the, prop, the, the, the product or the company so that you're knowledgeable of what they do, how they do it. Where are some of their hotels if it's the hotel industry? So make yourself knowledgeable, spend some time, some effort on doing a little bit of research. You know, um, someday you'll have Professor Barron if you, if you take a, uh, your master's program. And the one thing that, that, that he taught all of us was to be prepared, prepare, over prepare. So if you're gonna interview, be over prepared. And I think I could, if I could just add to that, I think it's important right now where you're at today. Uh, if you haven't built a LinkedIn profile, you need to do that. And LinkedIn has a feature where you can ask to be mentored and you can specifically reach out to people that are in the hospitality industry and have them mentor you. Why is that important? Guys like Ken and I and Dr. Pat has made a career out of it, right? We are trying to pass on what we've learned to others. We, if, if a student calls me, I have a real soft spot for helping mentor. I know Ken does as well. But if you create a LinkedIn profile, talk about your degree and what your interests are, and you can send messages to any executive, and it's a numbers game, but to Ken's point, it's an electronic way of reaching out instead of the face-to-face, -face, but we've made tremendous contacts doing that. And the other caution is be careful with your Facebook profile because everybody pays attention to what you post on Facebook. So yeah. I think those would be important. It's very hard today to get an in-person interview. Um, and the only way around it that I've found to make connections is LinkedIn or some such platform where you can go direct to a, an individual. So you might want to explore that as an option. That's great advice, particularly about uh, be careful what you put on Facebook and uh, you know, I tell my, my students, I tell my own sons who are older, but I tell them this all the time because people are going to look at it and say, well, it's, it's none of their business. Well, except it's out there. So, you know, they're, they're, they're going to make it their business. You can make your opinions known in other, in other ways to your friends and family and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go to thank you, uh, uh, Ken and Rick, and thank you, Achille. It was a great question. Um, I want to, uh, before we go to the questions from the, uh, from the distant audience, I do want to say one thing at the risk of embarrassing him, but Sid, I will just say to you, uh, this presentation, especially the second part, this was custom made for you today, Sid. So, so Sid works in this area and Sid Sam, the guy that they're talking about, his bachelor's degree, what is it? Isn't it in IT or computer or something? Yeah. And then he went and got the master's with us and wow, now he's a star with, uh, with, uh, with TriStar Hotels. Uh, so it's cool. So just 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 mentioning that to you, Sid. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Now from our audience, um, I think I remember the first question, Jihan, and then you can help me with the others. First question was, uh, will how, how do you what's the relationship between robotics and replacing people's jobs? I mean, that was the gist of it. Yeah. So just you know, robots help humans. They don't replace humans. So um, uh, oddly enough, the, the employees at each one of the hotel love having the robot because it allows them to concentrate on their job and not have to do a, a menial thing like deliver towels to a guest room, even though that's what a guest 
requires. Uh, allows them to spend more time interacting with customers at the front desk, in the restaurant, wherever it might be. So I wouldn't worry about robotics uh, replacing employees. Uh, I think you see that in, in manufacturing to some degree. Um, but even in manufacturing, the human, pe the people that, that, that are, are the human assets actually perform at a higher level and require additional training and get more pay. So in a sense, uh, it's probably good. Yeah, and the skills are gonna change. I mean, look at Sam, look at Sid over here, who I hope we've, we've planted some seeds of hospitality in him, uh, in his undergraduate major, which is not hospitality. But you know what, the, you're right, Ken. And, and the answer is that, yeah, they're, we're not gonna need uh, runners to, to get things to rooms or utility people, but that's gonna be, there are gonna be more opportunities to do the kinds of things you're doing now and how to use the technology and even develop it further, you know? So, uh, so different kinds of jobs, but uh, they're, I think they're gonna grow probably. Mm -hmm. uh, Jihan, what was the uh, next question? I don't remember. Uh, Dr. Pat, there is one question uh, to about the HM books online. If um, they are thinking about integrating virtual reality into these online books, um, if and do they do, do you think they are effective? Uh, is this the way in the future? So this viewer is asking about their thoughts about virtual reality in training. Yeah, so, so um, everything's a step stone, right? So if you, if you look at the first Apple computer in 1976, and then you looked at what then became a laptop in 2000, and then you had the iPhone in 2000, 2007. An iPhone really in 2007 was a... Apple from 19, uh, 1976. So you're going to see the same, same technology changes in training or in some form of education. And virtual reality is certainly going to be that. Um, their problem is that you have to wear a three pound goggle. Um, that will change to where you'll have just normal glasses, you put the glasses on and um, you'll, you'll be able to train in a virtual reality environment. Um, and that's, that will be here probably in the next four or five years. Yeah. And, and thank you, Ken. Rick, do you have anything to comment on that? Yeah, I think Ken articulated it as we discussed our HM Bookstore platform. We went from one, one coding structure to HTML5, which will now open the opportunity to create those integrations for virtual training. So it will happen and it will eventually be sequenced in, but it has to be a comfortable delivery to Ken's point about the visual aspect of it. And yeah, to so, your point, Ken, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, so, so, so what Rick is saying is, is that you have to have a platform to deliver the virtual reality. Um, and HTML5 currently has that ability. And of course, that'll probably change the HTML6 and 7 sometime in the future. Yeah. So. And just uh, you know, to add to that, Ken, and Rick, I think you're right. And uh, uh, Jihan, I don't remember if it was, uh, in the in the uh, video that I watched of the of the uh, fourth installment of uh, of uh, uh, the post COVID uh, series of seven seminars which we're doing, which by the way Ken was one of the stars in last night. I don't remember if it was there that I saw it or this morning uh, in the New York Times, um, and because uh, I get the electronic version, so I can push a button and it shows videos. And this was of a ship and uh, how ships are gonna come back eventually. And then, you know, of course, all, I don't know if you heard the news today, the ship restoration of cruises was delayed again today. And most of the companies are gonna wait several more months now. But this was a video showing what one of the shipping companies is experimenting with, whereby they could take an inside cabin and, you know, not just put a picture up of a porthole, but actually have a virtual experience of what's happening in that cabin, changing the mood, changing the view, changing the light, and you know, who knows, that could happen in hotel rooms too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it could, could be a new world. Any other question? There was another question, wasn't there, Jihan? Yes, there is one more question, uh, Dr. Pat, uh, for them. How is the text message app Rover working? Do guests use it often? Is there a learning curve with it? 
Yeah, so so Rover is not really an app. Um, it, it's 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 a Rover really is uh, mining text information and any information we want that's in the property management system. I mean, we're going to be layering uh, or, or have layers of graphs that will talk about the leisure business, the corporate business, um, three or four hotels like Star Report does currently. We're going to be able to graph and put those graphs over each other so one hotel can see if it's doing better or worse. Um, so Rover is much more than, than, than sort of a communication device to and from the customer. But like any good song, you have to have a hook. And the hook here is the uh, text mining and being able to communicate with the customer. Once we have that, we'll be able to even create more data uh, from the customer on their likes and dislikes. And um, hopefully we're the Microsoft of the hotel industry going into the computer age or, or, or into the uh, technology age. Well, we have two minutes left, three. And I, I'm intrigued. I don't have a question. I guess I have a, a suggestion for discussion that we're not today, but that we need to have eventually. And Ken, you made a statement and you must've made it to me last week too, because I had a note pinned to my computer at home, uh, reminding me to bring this up and I'm gonna be doing session seven, uh, which is gonna be management and operations uh, and cleanup, not cleanup, but uh, the consolidation of everything we talked about in the first six sessions of our post COVID. And I had a note written to myself and, it, and I couldn't understand the writing on it because I did it in a hurry. Now I just understood it. You said hospitality without a human touch. And I made a note of myself to myself about that. And I'm going to talk about that tonight. I might even have to do another quick two or three minute interview with you. Okay. What do you really think that's going to happen? Yes. Do you? And, and it's going to happen very quickly. Um, it's going to happen very, very quickly. As, as soon as, as soon as we, we get into uh, um, autonomous cars or autonomous vehicles, um, it's going to happen very, very, very quickly. And what's the advantage I, I, going to I, be to us of that? Go ahead, Rick. I, I think, Pat, if you just take a look at the world of Amazon, I mean, I do everything on Amazon, it seems like, anymore, and it just comes to my house, and I don't yeah. really interact with anything. When I have a problem, I package it up in 30 days, I get a credit. And actually, I get a credit as soon as the UPS guy scans it on right. return. So I think it will happen. But I think to Ken's point, in, 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 there'll still be a human touch. There always has to be. And there always has to be a human management aspect of it. But I think we're also looking at a changing consumer base that's going to just expect that. Mm. Maybe our, maybe our cat, you know, us baby boomers are probably not going to be that even though we're early adopters for our right. age group. Right. Well, you, but might, I think, you might be a baby boomer, Rick. I don't think I am. Uh, well, we'll I debate am, that later. I am at the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, we're, I'm, a, I'm by a whisker. But, you know, I think the, the students that we're speaking to today could probably help you answer that question as well. I think they would have some insight as to what they're I, I would invite all of the students here to think about that. Next week, we won't be the full session next week because my presentation is only about 15 minutes long. But I'd like to have this discussion with you a little bit because I want you to help me to, to um, frame it properly for when I do session seven. Because otherwise, if I, if I start arguing too much about the importance of technology, G, Dr. Jihan will cut me off uh, from, the, from the screen. Well, but well, I, well, I love technology. I'm just saying I, I think there's some kind of balance here someplace. Let me, Absolutely. Let, there is. Huh? Let, me, let, me let me finish. Sid, can you un, unmute? Absolutely. Tell us all a little bit about what 5G is going to do to technology in the world in front of us. Uh, 5G is going to speed up connections extremely. Um, you know, download speeds and things like that that everybody's been dealing with have been cut in like half and fourths. Um, the things you're going to be able to do on phones is going to be incredible. You can pretty much things you would have to do on a high end computer, you can run with phones using um, like virtual machines through services. So you'd pay like a subscription for a month and be able to do extremely high speed things on a phone rather than having to go home and, um, you know, with a really invested machine, take care of things. So it's, it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for just the everyday person to be able to do things that, you know, NASA was doing five years ago. It's, Oh, thank Incredible. you. And Ken, I want to just uh, thank you and Rick. I, we're, I just, we're out of time. We're over time. 
I want to thank both of you, uh, but Ken, don't leave after we end the session. If you would stay on for a second. I want to thank both of you for uh, being here today and also to, uh, uh, to thank you for the years that, that you've given us. And Ken is also on our board of advisors and, uh, and he's very faithful about when he could coming live to the meetings. He's been coming virtually to the meetings. We hope the live day comes again soon and that, and that Rick is gonna come with him soon too. And then Pat can cook for both of them. And that's not gonna be virtually. That's gonna be real food with real smells and everything. It'll be wonderful. So, and to our audience, thank you again for being with us uh, today. And uh, we will resume this series of, uh, of speakers uh, in uh, <clears throat> the end of January. We'll have the date for you. It'll be on Tuesdays again, slightly different time. It'll be on Tuesdays again. And uh, we'll resume the series. So thank you all. And students, we'll see you.